Welcome everyone to a conversation between our 2019 Service to the Arts honoree, Sarah Arison, and Ann Pasternak. I'm Rona Citrin. I'm thrilled to be a sponsor of our amazing summer series, as well as a past trustee and treasurer of Anderson Ranch. It's my privilege today to introduce you to two of the most inspiring people I am lucky enough to call my friends, Sarah Arison and Ann Pasternak. Sarah is the president of the Arison Arts Foundation. In addition to this, she's extremely active across numerous national arts organizations that represent the fields of visual arts, performance arts, and music. To name a few, hold your breath. She's a trustee of the National Young Arts Foundation, a vice chair of the board of MoMA PS1, a trustee of MoMA, a trustee of American Ballet Theater, a trustee of the Brooklyn Museum, a trustee, yay, a trustee of New World Symphony, a trustee of Lincoln Center, and a member of the Board of Directors of American for the Arts. Her passion has been the National Young Arts Foundation, which was established in 1981 by her grandparents, Lynn and Ted Arison. The, its mission has been to identify and nurture the most accomplished young artists in the visual, literary, design, and performing arts, and assist them at critical junctures, I'm losing my space, in their educational and professional development. The timing of this critical juncture has been determined to be when young people are between the ages of 15 to 18 or in grades 10 through 12. Application-based awards are given to students across the United States these select students are given the opportunity to be challenged and inspired by both professionals and institutions in their fields and to build lifelong relationships as they develop their skills and craft. On the personal side, I would be remiss not to add that Sarah and her husband are also new parents of the most adorable baby girl, Olivia. And she is now, what, three months old? 12 weeks. 12 weeks. <laughs> Now, Ann Pasternak, so much to say, but I will keep it short. <laughs> Ann is the Shelby White and Leon Levy Director of the Brooklyn Museum. Anderson Ranch is so thrilled to have Ann back on the podium. She was here last in 2014 to lead a two-day symposium titled Making the Change They Want to See. This symposium invited artists to share how art can be the agent for change. Ann has been championing the critical link between art and, so and social justice for over 30 years. Prior to joining the Brooklyn Museum in 2015, Anne served as the president and creative director of Creative Time, and this was for almost 25 years. 21. Okay, just Who's over counting? 20. Just over 20 <laughs> years. Okay, it seemed like 25 years. <laughs> While there. She initiated projects that gave artists opportunities to respond to political and, and environmental challenges, while also expanding their practice and work globally. This past spring, Anne was honored to be chosen as one of Crane's 50 most powerful women in New York. Thank you. <laughs> now, before turning over the microphone, I would like to thank Toby Devin Lewis, our presenting sponsor, Oolite Arts, our premier sponsor, and others who are making this event possible, including our national council sponsors, corporate and media partners, and all of you who support the very important mission of Anderson Ranch. Thank you so much. Rona, you're very good at that. So um, it is you know, yesterday with Nick, we were talking about joy. And I want to say it's a joy to be back here at Anderson Ranch. It's a joy to be with you, Sarah. And before we start, I just wanted to say that, you know, often Sarah is compared to or discussed as the next Aggie Gund. And we all know, yes, and it's real. Um, we all know that Aggie is one of the great philanthropists of our time, one of the great collectors of our time. Artists are passionate about her because she's so knowledgeable um, and has such close relationships with artists. And she cares deeply about the social good just like you do, Sarah. And we're gonna talk about that, but I also wanna say that there's somebody else that's not in this room right now, that I think that if she knew you, and maybe she does, I don't know if she does or doesn't, um, she would be thrilled to know you, 
Uh, and that is Toby Devin Lewis, who, who underwrites this series. And Toby has been important to many of us, certainly for me in my life. She has been an incredible trailblazer who cares passionately about artists, who cares passionately about supporting young artists. She was born in Brooklyn. Uh, and, um, and I think she would be thrilled to know that you're here today carrying the torch for the things that she and Aggie carry so much about. So I think it was just appropriate to really start with some love for Toby and for you. Well, thank you. To be mentioned in the same breath as, <laughs> as those two women is um, an incredible honor. And you know, I, I've been very lucky to have Aggie as an inspiration and to just watch the way she carries herself through this world and the way she engages with artists and um, how she kind of uses you know, the institutions that she's working with to serve these artists and the community uh, in the most extraordinary ways. Well, we're gonna talk about all those good things. Okay. But you know, yesterday, um, the conversation ended. How many of you were here yesterday? Oh. Almost all of you, okay, good. Nice. So the conversation ended almost with grandmothers, right? Mm -hmm. We're gonna probably start with grandmothers, but let's start, start from the very beginning. You're a little girl, you're living in Miami. What is your exposure to art? You know, I was, I, looking back, I um, didn't realize how lucky I was at the time that I was constantly surrounded by art. Kind of every interaction with my grandparents, who I was extremely, it's still, my grandmother's still living, it still am extremely close to, um, kind of revolved around art. You know, we were always, you know, time together, we were going to the ballet or going to the symphony. When we were traveling together, we were traveling to see museums or, you know, shows. And... At the time, it was something that I definitely took for granted um, and did Were you not... annoyed like most little kids? Ugh, not the ballet again, Grandma. <laughs> um, I, did, I happened to love the ballet, and I was a baby ballerina, so I was very into that. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it was... I, it, I it, so wish we had pictures of you as baby ballerina to oh, project right it's, now. Yeah, there, I, I was definitely tall and awkward and gangly. Next <laughs> and, time. And not, next time, <laughs> I promise. Um, you know, it was, I was, it's interesting because coming from, you know, a family where almost everybody in my family um, was an artist. My mom was a photographer and a sculptor and a painter. My brother is now a musician. My sister likes to write. My grandmother's a writer. I was the opposite. I was like the math science nerd. I was a mathlete. I was, and kind of, I don't know whether it was, you know, rebellion or just the way I was, but, you know, didn't, didn't really like engage or understand, you know, where all these artists were coming from. And so, you know, it was fine and I, I enjoyed the experience with them, but I didn't, um, I don't think I, I connected um, in, in the way that I do now. And then something happened. You went off to college and as a mathlete, you decided you were gonna go pre-med. Yes. And then there was an abrupt halt. <laughs> there was an abrupt halt. So, you know, like I said, I was always very passionate about science. Um, you know, knew from a very long time that I wanted to be pre-med. Uh, was really interested in genetics. You know, was planning on going on uh, to medical school. And um, in the middle of my sophomore year, I was in Miami for the holiday break, and my grandmother invited me to go with her to the Gala for Young Arts, which you guys will learn all about later. Um, and I went not be and I didn't really, as much as it was a part of their life and my grandparents had founded it, you know, they, they were kind of doing it, they never really pushed it on us. So we didn't really know um, much about it. And I said, yes, I'll go with her, not because I was particularly interested, but because I wanted to spend time with her. And we're sitting here at this event, and I guess one of the mothers of the winner that year had heard either my name or somehow knew I was connected with the family who founded the organization. And she came up to me with tears in her eyes, and she grabbed me, and she said, I have to thank you so much for everything you and your family have done. You know, my son used to come home from school and sit on the floor and draw, and I would yell at him. I would tell him to go do his real work, his math, his science. And seeing him here being, you know, recognized, being given scholarships by universities for this talent, being taught and recognized by the greatest luminaries in his field, I realized that this is his real work and that I should support it. And it was, it, you know, took my breath away and I kind of processed it overnight and realized the importance of the organization, not just for the artists that it was helping um, at that incredibly critical juncture, but also, you know, for the society at large for the perception of the value of these artists. And, you know, in realizing that, I also realized that, you know, as with many family organizations, unless somebody from the family got involved, it would probably not continue. And so I went to my grandmother the next morning and I knocked on her door and I said, Grandma, I want to help. 
And so I went back to college, dropped organic chemistry, which was great. And, <laughs> and, um, but I can't understand why you would want to study genetics. Right. Okay, keep going. <laughs> and, um, and ended up with a, a double major in, um, in business and art history and a minor in French. You know, and I did a double major in business and art history. Really? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. You no. learn something new every day. Yeah. Um, and... And joined the board of Young Arts and, and of the New World Symphony, which is the other organization that my grandparents founded, and just kind of started to, to learn, um, really, and, and take things in. My grandmother and I worked together on it for a very long time until she decided it was time to step away. Um, and it was the greatest decision of my life because I now get to spend my days you know, working with the most incredible artists, with people who have the same ethos and vision and desire to, you know, help change the world, and um, as opposed to being in a lab all day by myself. But which that changes <laughs> the world, too. Science right. is great. Science is and we're great. We're going to talk but... about STEM and STEEAM eventually. <laughs> right. But I, I, want to, um, I want you to talk a little bit about Young Arts, and I'm curious, how many of you here have ever experienced a Young Arts event? Have any of you? Oh, so a few of you, which is fantastic, because, you know, I think, you know, you heard how many boards she's sitting on. And for all of us who um, you know, get to serve for, with Sarah, uh, we feel incredibly blessed that she's willing to share some of her time away from Young Arts. But we also understand it's her number one priority, as it should be. It's a fabulous organization. So talk a little bit about Young Arts. So, you know, Young Arts, my grandfather actually founded Young Arts because growing up he wanted to be a concert pianist. And much like, you know, that student whose mom kind of changed my life path, he did not receive support from his family, from um, educators, from the community at large to pursue that passion. The response was, go get a real job. And so he did. And when he reached a point that he was able to give back, he looked at my grandmother and said, I never want another young, talented, um, passionate artist to go through what I went through. I want them to have all of the resources that they need to pursue an education and a career in the arts if that's what they want to do. So that is how Young Arts was founded. And originally in 1981, and kind of for the, for the couple of decades, for the three decades after that really, um, it was about one core program where every year we would get applications from around the country. We're at now about you know, right around 8,000, 8,500 applications a year from, from... That's a lot to it's, go through. It's a lot to go through. And they're, they're like sending films and audio mm -hmm. recordings and, you know, the yeah. portfolios of visual art. Well, now that it's we can, all disciplines. Now that we can do things digitally, it's much better. Like back in the old days, you know, we would get 4,000 VHSs and, and have to have, right. you know, adjudicators with TVs and VCRs. Will you do me a favor and ask me never to be an adjudicator? I will never <laughs> ask you. you to be an adjudicator. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> So, you know, get all of these applications, and then the top 170 were chosen to come to Miami for one week in January. And during that week, they would do um, classes with master teachers. So, you know, Placido Domingo would do voice, and Baryshnikov would do dance, and Frank Gehry would do design, and, um, you know, kind of so on and so forth, and real luminaries. Um, and Nick Cave will do art. And Nick Cave will and do Bob. art next year. Right. <laughs> and Bob will do design. Um, <laughs> So, you know, master classes and then workshops that were both within their own discipline as well as multidisciplinary. So we will put a filmmaker and a dancer and a writer together and give them half a day and some equipment and say, go make something, which I think is something that's really important and unique um, because artists really aren't often given that opportunity to collaborate with other disciplines to see what artists from other disciplines are doing. Um, and so... You know, I've seen so many transformations in, in artists when we expose them to you know peers that are in different disciplines. It changes the it changes their practice. And I could think a few examples of that. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt no, you. No, go. But I got very excited because she sent me a video when I first came to the museum, which I've been you know dying to actually show at the museum and haven't yet succeeded. Mm -hmm. Um, of a, one of those collaborations between dancers, singers, and a video maker. Um, you know, it's, it's based on, it was a Solange song, right? Yeah. Um, where she's, you know, say his name. And so they're dancing, it, the dance was just incredible. Mm -hmm. I, I, I I'm not describing it, I wish we were actually showing it, but it's one of the most powerful works yeah. that I've seen in a long time. And, um, you know, a lot of museums wouldn't show something that's done by young artists, mm -hmm. right? But it's so powerful that I've been dying to show yeah. it at the museum. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> but you tell the story actually, because I remember a story you told me um, of two collaborations between one of the master uh, cl 
class artists mm -hmm. and one of the students. Yeah. That's continued to flourish. So, so you know, the, the original program was that just one week of workshops, of um, master classes, workshops, performances that were open to the public, and we would bring in school children to see them and adjudications, and then they would receive scholarships from us. Um, and there was also a student list service where universities would identify um, winners for scholarships through our program. So it was really great um, in that it was an unrestricted scholarship from us and then an academic scholarship. And then, you know, when I joined the board, I was, you know, just about to graduate college and thinking a lot about alumni and kind of that next critical juncture, you know, that, you know, whether you're post BFA, post MFA, whatever secondary education you're doing, and you're kind of kicked out into the world and expected to, you know, pay your rent and figure out your life. And, and there's no, there's no net, there's no safety and net. And there's no safety net. And, you know, you look at professions, you know, if you're going to be a lawyer or a doctor, there's a very defined, you know, way of this is what you're doing, this is the test you're going, this is the career fair right. you're going to, this is where you're being recruited. But for artists, they are kind of kicked out into the world and, you know, they may have been taught technically how to be a fantastic artist, but they don't really know how to navigate the world that they're going into um, and are often, because of that, taken advantage of, you know, you see it all the times with, with galleries or with managers and agents and contracts. I mean, it's, it's horrifying what a lot of them get into. And so, you know, wanted to, decided I wanted to kind of take, always keep that core program because I think that first critical juncture of, you know, for them a lot of times it's the first time they're hearing you are an artist. It's the first time they're hearing you can do this. It's the first time they're hearing I will give you support in any way that you need to pursue this. Um, but then what about future critical junctures? Um, and so we kind of started working to develop programming to help, you know, like I said, that post whatever secondary education it might be. Um, and, and onward until they hit a point where they can turn around and be a master type teacher and give back to the right. next generation. Um, and so, you know, we were looking, we kind of, over time and in speaking to a lot of the alumni about what they needed, realized there were kind of five pillars that we could provide um, that they probably wouldn't right. get from anywhere else, and that's mentorship, networking, professional development, physical space, and funding. You know, it's very unusual for an organization to really be invested in the pipeline of development. It's mm -hmm. a very special thing. Yeah. So. And so what you were referring to is, you know, one of the things that we, one of the programs we came up with a few years ago was called Salon Series, and it was putting a very young alum with a luminary and putting them in discussion and kind of seeing what came out. And, and we put, um, he was, he's this great musician. He went through our program for jazz. And we put, but he, you know, in, in since going through the program was already working on a, um, score for a movie that was at Sundance. He was organizing benefit concerts. He was collaborating with, you know, artists of many other disciplines. And we put him in conversation with Glenn Ligon. So, you know, we're sitting here thinking Glenn is going to give him the wisdom of the world and it's going to be, you know, a, an, an older, very well-established artist imparting, you know, wisdom to this next generation. And it turned into Glenn saying, you know, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of what you've done. You know, I've really tried to um, branch into other disciplines, to collaborate with artists of other disciplines, and I've been failing miserably. Can you, you know, give me advice on how you've done it? <laughs> right. And, and this, you know, this 21-year-old kid is sitting there going, you know, did Glenn just ask me, fuck? Okay, let's go. Right. Um, and it was a great conversation, and it turned into, they are now working on a project um, that is all about trauma um, when people are coming out of the incarceration system. And um, collaborating on that, so the, the young artist Samora is doing the music, Glenn is doing the visuals, they're being advised by Anna Devere Smith, who's another young arts master teacher, and just received a grant from the Art for Justice. So it, it ended up being this incredible network of, you know, people who have, uh, are, are, have been kind of affiliated in, in the young arts family for many years, and all coming together, you know, Aggie is, is a trustee emerita, um, all coming together for this project that is going to be so dynamic, you know, so engaging, so enlightening for us to see and to understand, you know, something that I don't think we would ever be able to understand otherwise. Right. It's amazing. And I just want to say uh, for a second, this is why I need my glasses. Um, the alum, uh, the, you know, this is not just your, obviously, you know, some let's support young artists and see them fly. This is a very serious program, obviously. And such luminaries as Viola Davis. I'm going to screw up her name and I love her so much. Susanna Sadowas. Susanna. Susanna Sadkowski. Yeah. 
love her. Uh, Carrie, Wa actually, I don't know what her pronoun is. What's her pronoun? Is it is she? Is she? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, uh, Carrie Washington, Josh Groban, Daniel Ashram, Doug Aiken. The list goes on and on and on of the alumni, Paul Chan, of this program. Mm -hmm. You know, artists who have showed at the museum, artists who have spoken here and done work workshops here at Anderson Ranch, um, and many of you know well were teenagers who got their start, their first investment through Young Arts. It's really incredible. Okay, so now you realized early on what uh, an arts organization can do for artists, and you've been committed to supporting artists in lots of different ways. So talk about that. So Young Arts is a great priority, but you see yourself in lots of different disciplines in different ways. You know, it's, I kind of, in starting to get involved with other organizations, it was really thinking about the fact that you know, young arts is incredibly important. That, that juncture is amazing. But it's kind of pointless unless there are places for these artists to go. And so how can we um, look at creating, you know, this, this network of support so that they may start with young arts and then they're kind of passed off, you know, at that next juncture to another organization that's going um, to promote them and, you know, continue their professional development and help with their vis visibility. And I am such a firm believer in collaboration in this field, which, you know, is, is hard because, you know, many organizations, it's like you have your donors and you have your board and you worry about, you know, if, if you know, they discover an orga another organization, then funding is going to go there. Um, but I really think that it is so important to create, you know, like I said, a network of support so that there's always, whatever point in the career they're in, there's always a place for them where they are taken care of. Right. Um, and, you know, also, I think in our field, I mean, obviously in our field, resources are so limited. You know, it's, it's every other day we hear about the NEA being cut. And I think a way to... That, that <laughs> ship sailed a long time ago. I mean, ago. <laughs> you know, we, it's, we, we already, the amount that we get is minuscule already. New York City's <gasps> Department of Cultural Affairs actually gives more funding than the entire NEA. Yes, by like a hundred and some million dollars. I mean, and it's, it's... And the New York City isn't all that great, by the way. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, wonderful, but, but yeah. Um, <laughs> All the, those of us who run organizations in New York City just wish there was more. Right. Anyway, yeah. So, so in a field where you know these resources are so limited, it's kind of looking at you know how can we help each other. You know, for, so for example, identifying talent is takes a lot of resources. And so, you know, I am always speaking to fellowships or internships or residencies, saying, listen, if you are looking for because we, we are able to look at our alumni database, which is over 20,000 people, and you know, we, wow. can, we can kind of divide people into artistic discipline, age, geographic location. You know, if you say we are looking for the best writers you know, in the 18 to 25 age group, I can, I can literally hand you a list of people and say, you know, look at these, is there anybody that you'd like to get in touch with, as opposed to that organization having to find the resources to, to identify that talent. Um, you know, an example of that would be Sundance, uh, Sundance Film Festival launched a, um, a program called Ignite about four years ago, mm -hmm. and it was for filmmakers 18 to 25. And I kind of was like, hey guys, we, uh, so we have 15 to 18, we can literally just funnel you these filmmakers. And, and, and set up a partnership, and it's amazing. And we've now had a number of, of our Young Arts winners go through this, and Sundance is great because once you're in the Sundance system, you're kind of in and part of the family and just continue going through their different programming. Um, and so as, as Rona was listening, I am involved with a lot of different organizations, but rather than feeling like they're kind of pulling in different ways or it's, you know, pulling, you know, one pulling time from the other, I actually look at it as the best possible way to figure out how can we collaborate and offer more support. And it's a healthy ecology. And it's reflective of all of your interests, mm -hmm. and it's reflective of the scope of work at Young Arts, of filmmaking, writing, dance, you know, music of all, of all types, visual art, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, and you're on, you work on all those boards. At Brooklyn, you actually chair our education committee. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it, it's interesting because you're also very committed to not only supporting artists who will have professional lives, but also recognizing the importance of an arts education mm -hmm when we've seen budgets nationally cut dramatically for arts education. So you talk a little bit about the importance of arts education in our schools? You know, it's, you, you know, as, as well as many people in this room, there are so many statistics. It's, um, you know, students from low income, yeah. 
are, um, uh, with arts education are three times more likely to graduate college. You know, there are, you, you can go on with these, these statistics for days. Um, but I, uh, you know, also think that in a lot of these underserved populations, um, the, the kind of only way um, that a lot of the parents or educators can see getting out or getting education is through an athletic scholarship, you know, not realizing that actually arts is, there are so many art scholarships out there and that's a way to kind of go out and get an education. Um, but, you know, you also look at, and you mentioned STEM versus STEAM earlier, the STEM thing clearly isn't working <laughs> as far as, you know, the, the people that are coming out of the system. And in a time when you look at the number of jobs that are going to be lost to automation, you know, what is left? And what is left is the creatives. You know, this is some, the creativity is something that cannot be automated as much as, you know, Sotheby's is selling like AI paintings, which, <laughs> which is, is, you know, we'll see how that goes. Um, but, but, you know, the, the creative field is something that, that can't be automated. And a lot of times, you know, somebody's like, oh, well, you know, why should I support the arts? Like, why do I want to, you know, buy a ticket to a Broadway show? And I say, you know, look at the world around you. Everything around you has been touched by an artist. The clothing that you're wearing, that's a fashion designer, that's an artist. The house that you're living in, architect, artist. The television show that you're watching, that is a writer and a composer and an actor and, you know, a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. And there is really nothing around you that has not been touched by an artist. And so it's not about, you know, going to a museum and looking at a painting or going to a Broadway show and seeing that. It is every aspect of your life. Um, is is touched by creatives and by artists, and you know if if they are not supportive, life would be really boring. <laughs> and you know, artists, I, I completely agree with you. And I think also art is about freedom, right? And where else in society do we have completely free thinkers who don't have to worry about what their company is going to think of what they say, or you know, if they're in you know a position of public you know, um, mm -hmm. authority, they, they have to stick to the party line, et cetera. And I think that freedom of thinking is important for democracy. I also think that freedom um, to think creatively should be a national priority. Because if we're gonna compete with China in the future, for example, we need creative thinkers. And the mm -hmm. A should be put into STEM to put it yeah. back into STEAM for, this, for our nation. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an issue of national priority from my, yeah. my point of view. It is, and I, I think, you know, also, I think artists have a deep compassion um, for what is going on in the world around them and an ability to show it in a engaging um, and enlightening way. And so you, there are so many artists that you could name who are using their talent or visibility to address so many other issues in our society. So you know Melchin very well. Um, he's amazing, and uh, you know, he has done projects. By the way, we're getting the, the lead piece <gasps> at the museum. Shh, don't tell anyone. It's, it's a secret for 200 people. Um, I'm really excited. <laughs> you know, but Mel has done projects, you know, after, um, after Katrina in New Orleans and around Flint, Michigan, that was all about raising awareness, raising funds. You look at what Theastra... Changing legislation. Changing legislation. Doing the real work. You look at what Theastra has done to a devastated neighborhood in Chicago, um, rebuilding it and creating a community there through creativity. Um, Titus Kafar is doing the same in New Haven. Nick, I mean, you know, he's turning his storefront and working with the public school right across the street. Mm-hmm. Um, you look at, you know, Mark Bradford in art for, at uh, Art and Practice, you, who's working with foster children. Um, Hank, Rick Lowe in Houston. Hank Willis Thomas and Four Freedoms. Yep. You know, the list goes on and on of these artists who, yes. By they, the way, women are doing the work, too. La, yeah. Latoya <laughs> Ruby, the, um, the Latoya Ruby Frazier body of work um, mm -hmm. about Flint, Michigan, where, you know, she documented a family of four generations and what was going on there. And you see these images, and they're so much more powerful than, you know, reading some black and white newspaper print. It, it humanizes it. How many of you were at the Notorious Conference I worked on years ago here? Yeah, uh, so um, you might remember, thank you for having come back. Uh, you, <laughs> you might remember Lori Jo Reynolds, mm -hmm. who uh, refers to her art as legislative art, and she worked for 11 years to shut down a supermax prison in Illinois. Right. You know, and change legislation within Illinois mm -hmm. around 
uh, privatization of prisons and yeah. uh, supermaxes. Anyway, yes. there's there's really powerful work going on. Yeah, and and like I said, you know, I think artists have a, a, a conscientiousness that um, they, you know, we see it in so many of the young arts kids right after they're coming out of the program. They're organizing benefits concerts. They're, you know, creating programs for arts education in their hometown high school, and they the work that they do is transformative. They're not just creating beautiful work, they're also changing communities. That's, that's absolutely true. So art has a lot of power. It has, artists have the power to change community, to change legislation. A lot of people aren't aware that kind of work is happening. What other special powers uh, do, do, does, do artists have in particular? What, uh, what special, I mean, I, as, as someone Superhero who, artist powers. As someone who was never, you know, as a kid, it was like, I couldn't handle drawing in a coloring book because if I went outside of the lines, I would have a meltdown. I was that child. <laughs> so, um, so people are always like, oh, you know, you love the arts and you support artists. You know, are you an artist yourself? I'm like, God, no. Nobody wants me to be an artist in, in any form. Um, and it's why I have this astounding respect, I think, for artists of, because I am in awe of, you know, where do these ideas come from, these ideas and these talent and this passion? And... Um, and and you know I think that I think their superpower is to um, really wake us all up in a in a lot of different ways and and show the world in a way that is um, that is different and that is engaging and that uh, you know makes makes you want to make change yourself. And I think that's a superpower of cultural institutions when they exercise their power correctly, right? Yes. That um, we may not agree with what the artist is always saying, but we're thinking about where we've come from and where we are mm -hmm. differently than we might in our, you know, everyday sort of lives or, or um, you know, friend bubbles. Yeah. yeah. Yes, because it's, 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 you know, we are definitely in bubbles and it is, I think artists can take us out of those bubbles and, and you know, they're, they're chronicling what is going on in our society today. And you look at, that's why I was actually fascinated by art history, because I hated regular history. I found it to be dry and boring, and I hated the dates, and it was just, you know, it wasn't fun. And I loved art history because you, I could learn history in looking at the art, um, because the artists are, are chronicling, you know, what is going on in the world around us. I think it's good for those of us who maybe have ADD to do art history <laughs> right. instead of history. So talk to us a little bit about your philosophy of philanthropy. You lead the Family Foundation now. Uh, you're a philanthropist in your mm -hmm. own right. What, what is your philosophy? You know, I, like I was saying um, earlier, I think collaboration. I mean, I, I feel like I, that's like the drum I've been beating for so many years, and I'm going to continue doing it, is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. You know, figure out ways to work together, to do co-programming, you know, um, let's kind of pool these resources and do as much with them as we can. Um, also, there was an article, and I wrote it down because I was not going to read it, um, about, I didn't, did you read the New York Times piece of, on Darren Walker last week? Of course I did. I yeah. tweeted it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not on Twitter, so I'm sorry I missed your tweet. But, I don't think anybody follows uh, you. It's fine. <laughs> but he, in, he was talking about his work at Ford Foundation, and he said it's a journey. I hope I brought a sense to the organization that we have to walk more humbly, that we actually don't have the answers. The answers are in communities and in the people that we are investing in. They are the key to unlocking solutions. I kind of like read that. Nine Darren times. is one of the most brilliant people on the planet. I, it's just yes, <laughs> yes. There's there's nothing to say to that, but yes. He's been a big inspiration in my practice mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so you know, in in reading that and kind of reading it over and over, um, I thought it was so important because we don't have the answers. We don't really necessarily understand the needs of those who we are trying to help. We have to engage those who we are trying to help. They need to be at the table with they us. They have to be at the table with us and we have to listen to them. You know, we were having a discussion yesterday about um, the educational program with the Brooklyn Museum with teachers. And you were saying that they were coming in and only when they were coming in and we were talking to them that you realized how much they needed. And how, how basic the needs how, were. Exactly. So, so to give you all a sense, uh, you know, Brooklyn Museum, for those of you who haven't been, is in central Brooklyn. And 52% uh, of our high school students don't graduate. The largest number of um, incarcerated people in New York State come from central Brooklyn. So if you were to go into any classroom and you were to ask a kid, do you know anybody who's incarcerated, probably all of them would raise their hands. Um, so what does a museum do? knowing what impact do we have on our community when we know 52% of our kids aren't gonna graduate from high school. 
So these are the kinds of questions that we're talking about. And we just had a group of 21 principals from Central Brooklyn come and meet with us. And they were like, please, just do anything. Just do anything. And we realized one of the most basic, it sounds so not sexy, things we could do is ramp up our efforts to teach teachers because they're the constant in the schools. We started adopting some of these public schools and bringing our arts educators in there. It's a very complicated thing to do. It's a very time consuming thing to do. It's a very expensive thing to do. We thought maybe we just need to go further in our efforts mm -hmm. to teach the teachers. Yeah. But anyway, you know, what might we do? You know, we've been talking about what might we do, um, you know, job training for good union jobs. Not everybody needs to go to college, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, you know, we don't know. We're, we're, we're brainstorming. We're open to yeah. ideas. Yeah. But, um, but I think that... But they, they were at the table, and exactly. it was illuminating. And that's the only way, you know, the, going back to the five pillars that I, we were trying to um, help the artists that we work with at Young Arts, the only way we came up with that was in interviewing, I mean, I think we spent time talking to over 100 alums about their experiences and their needs and what right. we could do. And even, you know, we started a micro-grant program, which is grants of $1,000, but that can be transformative. It's a plane ticket to a residency. It is, you know, materials for a project. Like, whatever it is, um, it's really transformative. Uh, and so, so that is one thing, is really giving um, the, the people that you're trying to help a seat at the table and really listening and not thinking that you have all the answers. Right. And then um, another, this was actually said at the Aspen Ideas Festival, um, a Stanford, Stanford professor named Rob Reich, who directs um, the Center for Ethics and Society there said, and he's actually a, a critic of, of philanthropy, but something that he said was interesting, said foundations should be making long time horizon, risky experiments in social innovation that the government won't do and that the marketplace is unlikely to do. And so that is also something is, you know, looking at, what is something that the government definitely isn't going to take care of and that people might... Artists are not it. Yeah. <laughs> Artists are not it. <laughs> that we know. Um, and that, you know, ideas that you know, might, might be a little scary, might seem a little risky, but that is, you know, that's a place that we can have an impact. That's wonderful. Ashley, how are we doing on time? Oh, good. Terrific. Okay. So, you know, I was going to ask you a question about whether you have any artistic practice of your own. Do you really not have any art, artistic practice of your own? I don't. You don't dance anymore? I don't dance anymore. Yeah. I was thinking about this yesterday because in the audience, Mira Rebel, you know, was telling me that she's continuing to take classes here at Anderson Ranch. And that, you know, as a collector, how important it is that she is learning to make and how it's making her a better collector or more astute par partner mm -hmm. for the artist. But so I thought I would maybe ask you then, and, and by the way, you know, you could talk to Mira about this yourself, but Mira could be the, really the poster child for all collectors taking classes here at Anderson mm -hmm. Ranch. Um, so thank you, Mira. Uh, <laughs> um, so talk to us a little bit about your, your collecting practice, because we have a lot of collectors in the audience. You know, it's... Um you would kind of look at, and, and I've only started collecting recently, so it's not like I have you know, a substantial, substantial collection. Um, but for me, it's very personal. I would say that probably 90% of the works that I own, I have met the artist, spent time with them, spent time in their studio. Maybe they've been a young arts master teacher, maybe they're an alum. Um, and that, so in kind of looking at my collection, it's, it's almost a collection of memories. Um, which I really love and don't have anything in storage. And, you know, one of the reasons we got a house in Aspen is I just needed more wall space. Because <laughs> I love, you know, because everything has a memory and a personal story and a personal history and a personal collection, it's really, you know, it's great to be surrounded by those memories. And is there one work in the collection that's particularly meaningful? If there, if that, God forbid, the house went on fire, you had to grab one artwork? Oh my gosh, that's a really hard question. Um, my first piece of art was a painting that my grandmother gave me. Um, one of the things that we did um, was we traveled together during the summer in France and ended up, you know, went to the Musée d'Orsay and then ended up actually kind of tracing um, the, the path of the Impressionist. You know, we went to Giverny where Monet painted. Um, we went to Daubigny's studio, we went to um, uh, Cezanne's studio overlooking Mont Saint-Victoire and ended up in um, auvers sur oise which is where Van Gogh spent the last 69 days of his life, did 71 paintings and ended up shooting himself. And 
kind of after this trip and after I said I wanted to um, I wanted to help with young arts, she gave me a Boudin painting, who's you know one of, was was in the of impressionist course. school, and and so that is it kind of signifies the beginning of my relationship with art, of my you know, path in the art world, um, and of my relationship with my grandmother. You know, my grandmother um, took me to Alvin Ailey and it was the first time I saw a naked man. <laughs> <laughs> you win. <laughs> I mean, it was okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so, so we talked about your collection, and I thought maybe we would talk a little bit about what you're not seeing in the field of institutions that you wish you were seeing. I'm sure you think there's not enough collaboration right now. Collaboration, for I sure. I agree with you. What else? And, and, and I think it's actually starting to get better. I think, you know, with, with institutions and really with universities, um, it is that cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary work. You know, you look at most universities and you have your you know dance school here and your writers here and your architects here and they never meet and they never see each other's work and they never engage you know i think cal arts is probably the exception to that um because when you know walt disney was trying to create his movies he was not able to find an illustrator who was able to work with a um, composer who was you know able to work with a writer and so he founded cal arts yeah. so that they would all work together and be able to make movies. Um, but, you know, I, I do think... Did you read that biography? I didn't. Oh. Should I? I, I think so. Mike, okay. you read it, didn't you? The Disney biography? You think she should read it? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next on my list. In my free time with a 12-week-old, I'm going to read that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, so kind of, you know, really... And, and we're, you're starting to see it a little bit more, and I think the results are very interesting. Um, at American Ballet Theater, we just had... Um, Jessica Lane choreograph a piece and Sarah Crowner do the sets and it was at the sets and costumes and it was beautiful and powerful and I think it just adds so much more dimension to the work that each of the artists is doing. And I'm thinking about that a lot institutionally now that I'm running an encyclopedic art museum mm -hmm. with something like 250,000 <laughs> objects in the collection from 5,000 years of human creativity uh -huh. and you know it's interesting because I think that the traditional uh, sort of boundaries or silos mm -hmm. that art schools and institutions like museums have held to be true yep. don't resonate for artists today, don't mm -hmm. resonate for young patrons. And it's an opportunity to break down some of those walls. And mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a really liberating moment for artists as institutions start to really open up more. Although I'm expecting a bumpy ride with the New York press. <laughs> You've because some people are really invested in those silos. Yeah. No, but I, I think they're destructive to culture. I don't think they, I think they're destructive to the creative process. I think they're destructive to the creative process, and I don't think artists want to function within those. I mean, you, you heard... What do you think, we, artists? Nick? Yeah. Great, you heard it here. Yeah, and, and so, you know, these kind of institutions trying to force artists to, to operate only within these... Um, those parameters, it's, it's not respectful to them or their practice. I agree. And by the way, just since we're here, and I, you know I always do this, I'm always brainstorming in the moment, Nick would do incredible stage sets and costumes. Ah, all right. Right, Nick? I like. And, and you know Nick is like, that's, in the, that's on the list already. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so I do. I, I think that those silos are going to be a thing of the past, hopefully very soon. I do think it will be a little... I think it's going to take a time to dismantle I them. I also think it's really interesting, you know, for audiences um, to discover a new art form that they might love, you know? So if you're going to... If you are a fan of Sarah Crowner and love visual arts, but, you know, haven't really spent time with dance, mm -hmm. you know, weren't really interested in going to the ballet ever, and maybe you go to ABT to see the Sarah Crowner sets and realize, wow, I really like Jessica Lange and this is amazing and I'm gonna actually go see more performance. Right. So I think it's expanding, um, you know, the, um, you know, what, what people might, how, what, what they, how they discover what they might like. And young people are, are exposed to everything because they have something called the internet. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so they're just much more open and aren't interested in those, those uh, mm -hmm. sort of traditional boundaries. But it's interesting because, you know, I, Sarah knows that I had this epiphany with our David Bowie show at the Brooklyn Museum. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't want to do the David Bowie show because I didn't want to be accused of being too populist, which the museum sometimes had a 
been criticized of being too populist. And even just the whole conversation around populism is really, um, implies that elitism is good. So that's a, that's a big problem, but it's another conversation. But at any rate, you know, I said to the staff, cut a million dollars out of that budget, add, you know, work from the past 50 years of his life, talk about his, um, his incredibly strong uh, position on sexual freedom, um, you know, do the things that the British were a little more cautious about doing, yeah. right? Be more Brooklyn. <laughs> and what was so, and I was nervous. I was really nervous about this. And I do want to say, since my husband is here, he was like, do the Bowie show <laughs> over and over again. He was so upset that I hadn't wanted to do it. But my staff also was really pushing. So they, they met all those, you know, hurdles. And it was astonishing to me to see the critical press so positive, to see the audiences so excited. And you realize that Bowie, that as much as he's known as this, you know, musical legend, mm -hmm. he was an artist of many disciplines. Yeah. You know, costume, acting, film, mm -hmm. dance, visual art. We showed it all. And you know, it was interesting because we even had his collages and paintings. Paintings aren't so great, but um, it didn't matter. You know, you expect a museum to only show masterpieces. People were so hungry because he represented a kind of creative freedom that I think artists really long for. They don't want to be stuck in their boxes. No. And it's so great that at Young Arts and what you're doing with your philanthropy, mm -hmm. that people can cross disciplines and grow and work together. Well, I think recognizing people as creatives as opposed to this is a dancer. You know, there's a, in the film that was showing before we started, there's a quote um, from a girl who was a dancer and she goes, I, my, after my week at Young Arts, um, I stopped thinking of myself as a dancer and started thinking of myself as an artist, um, which I think is a really powerful statement of um, just, you know, the impact that really giving these artists freedom and care can have on how they view themselves and the world around them. Okay. So we're going to stop at that because yes. that was beautiful. <laughs> and we're going to open it up for questions. Um, there, is, uh, uh, there are two people who have microphones. Since we're live streaming this, we ask you to use the microphones. Who wants to go first? Go right ahead. Hi, thank you so much, uh, both of you. Uh, I am wondering, since I come from the commercial world and you are both in the nonprofit world, how you can talk, uh, or talk to us a little bit about collaboration with the commercial world. Great. You wanna start? You can first. You, you want can, me to? Yeah. Well, first of all, that was Jeannie Greenberg, if you don't know her. And, and I'm pretty sure it was Jeannie. I it was Jeannie. Okay, excellent. And, uh, <laughs> and Jeannie, you've always been really good at this because you've always had performance and embraced design as a high art form, et cetera. And I've been really interested in this at the museum because you know, part of my uh, you know, awakening with the David Bowie show was, why is it okay that we have Picassos and Monets and we also have the fiesta wear that I eat off of at home for, at breakfast every morning, but it's not okay to do David Bowie? And I realized somehow, somewhere along the line, our institutions became really ossified in what was considered excellence in the arts and what was not. And I realized that's really messed up, right? So I, you know, I think that you're starting to see uh, an opening and awakening of our institutions saying we have to keep up with our times and we have to really question and challenge the ways that we've always done work and work with artists in all of the you know, the ways in which they're working. I went to see the Rashid Johnson show yesterday at the Aspen Art Museum, and I love those ceramics with the potted plants in them. And I thought it'd be great if he did a workshop here at Anderson Ranch, by the way, <laughs> as I'm always ideating for everybody else. Uh, anyway, so I, I think it's really important. Um, you know, the artists here uh, that are in this room have all worked in different disciplines. And I think it's about time, and I know you've always cared about this, uh, Jeannie, that uh, you know, ceramics were, for example, not just seen as some sort of craft, but are back in the fine art conversation. Yeah, I, I think also, you know, helping with, with the professional development and, and being a resource for these younger artists. And that doesn't mean, you know, you taking them on and representing them. It just means, um, you know, being available to have a discussion to let them know how this industry is working. Um, you know, being open to just um, to, to teaching them, you know, the, the lay of the land of, of the world that they're getting into. Um, and I, I do think, um, you know, so many galleries are, are really supportive of shows at museums, 
which is great. These shows at museums could not happen without support of of galleries and of, and of expertise the, and expertise. Who knows better than what their artists have historically done than the galleries it, that have had a long term relationship exactly. with them, as we experience with Marilyn Minter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I think there's I think that. a lot of those tradition you know those traditional sort of separation between church and state between you know commerce and the nonprofits mm -hmm. you know they existed for good reasons but we've been seeing those boundaries eroding to the benefit of artists and institutions I, I think and so. galleries I, I think the the boundaries are eroding and I think the what is coming out of that is really spectacular there are some some of the greatest shows that I've seen recently are kind of done in collaboration with you know the gallery that's representing that artist and I think they're so much more powerful because the gallery does have you know a full a history of the you know and understanding the full history of the artist. You want to know something else that I love about the art market? Yes. <laughs> Says the girl whose whole uh, uh, adult life has been spent in the nonprofit sphere. Um, I may not be a fan of going to art fairs, but I love that there are all these galleries from around the world. Mm -hmm. And you go, oh, who's this artist that looks like Saul Lewitt? Lewitt? That's amazing. What? This artist was in the 1960s making this work in Ecuador. So, you know, your just world view of the arts just completely mm -hmm. expands. And I think that um, actually, you know, the art fairs have had a really profound impact on the globalization of, of what happens in museums. Yeah, and I think that, you know, going to fairs, you get... Up. I can't believe I'm making a defense of art fairs <laughs> out of the blue. Anyway, Unexpected. I might love to regret that. <laughs> yeah, you, I think you get an idea of, of what's going on in the world. Like, you kind of get to take the pulse of what's going on in the world. You know, what, what is the subject matter that you're seeing a lot? You know, what is the medium that you're seeing a lot? Oh, we're seeing a lot of ceramics. That's really interesting. Um, you, you get kind of this, this snapshot of Yeah, the and then world. you start to say, why are artists working with ceramics right now in an age of technology? Hmm. You know, you start to ask yourself questions mm -hmm. and you realize there's a larger sort of trend going on yeah. that's worth consideration. Who else has a question? Right over here. Uh, thank you so much for an inspiring talk. Yeah. Um, in your collaboration, Sarah, have you found new spin-off organizations being established for housing for artists, medical insurance for artists, um, aging security for artists? I do think that y y that is something that's being looked at and discussed now, um, are, are some of those basics, basic needs. Um, I'm having a, mo a mom brain moment, and I'm forgetting. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm oh. not seeing a lot of that. Are you seeing? Yeah. I um, who was a uh, the Foundation for Contemporary Arts out of New mm -hmm. York? They have um, an artist. I'm trying to remember what the. Is an emergency fund. An emergency fund. It was uh, established by uh, Jasper Johns mm -hmm. and Bob Rauschenberg, I think, back in the so, day. So yeah. So you know, if if something if there's a natural disaster and it's sandy and there's flooding and you know an artist studio is destroyed and all their work is destroyed. Um, there's a place that they can go. I think it's not as prevalent as it should be, um, things like that. Yeah, I, you know, I think there's some interesting experiments in New York City, for example, mm -hmm. um, where house, forget housing, I don't know that the city should be housing artists, I know I'm, not, I'm popular on this subject with artists, but um, uh, especially when there's like such homeless crisis, et cetera. Yes. But at any rate, um, where, studio. where studio space is nearly yeah. impossible to get, you know, there are these, you know, sort of gallery spaces or public mm -hmm. spaces and senior citizen homes and, you know, um, healthcare spaces and hospitals. So they have created an artist residency program where artists can, you know, have these spaces for a year, two years, but then they also have to do workshops and give back to the place where they're actually working. So we're starting to see, I think, a bit more experimentation mm -hmm. in, in those areas. But I do think it has a long way to go. Yeah. But I think what's good for artists is good for society, and we should have health care for all. But, you know, I'm <laughs> That's fashioned. another discussion, Ooh. too. Yeah, that's another discussion, too. OK, anyway, she didn't ask that. Uh, how about a question on this side? One last question. Oh, I messed this up. Really, none? I hear a lot of whispering. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to say then, if that was it, um, because she's so compelling, what do you have to add to, really? Um, I, ha I, I have a wish, and that wish is that um, in the future we see um, uh, uh, clones of Sarah Arison. <laughs> And um, Sarah, I, I, I feel incredibly blessed to not only have you as a friend and a partner in a kind of museum revolution, um, but I feel blessed to know you and to be by your side as I watch you change the world um, and um, expect great things 
from Sarah Arison, now and into the present. She will never cease, I'm quite confident, um, to astound you and to, to move you. And uh, on behalf of everybody at Anderson Ranch, um, I want to say thank you for um, joining us today. I want to say thank you for being honored by the ranch. It's an organization I absolutely love. It's the only place I know of where you know, famous artists from around the world come to make alongside children and amateurs and Mira Rubel. And um, <laughs> it's a very magical place, and it's magical in the ways that Young Arts mm -hmm. has its own special magical sort of um, uh, trajectory and history. Um, and I think it's really great, because I know when you came to Aspen, you really didn't, you know, this could be your hideaway. You have a very big life in New York and Miami, um, and it's very generous of you to come out of hiding a little bit, especially with a three-month-old child, beautiful baby, um, and, and share some of your love and your support with um, the Aspen community and with the ranch in particular. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.